Hi, travelers. Sophie Takagi Kaner here, just letting you know that we will be slowing our schedule down a little bit for the holidays. We've all got a lot going on in our personal lives, as I'm sure you do too. So our next episode, the Second Citadel Holiday Special, will be coming out on December 13th for $4 Patreon supporters and December 15th for everyone else. After that, we'll return in January with our regular schedule. Now settle in for this episode, which we bring to you with much love. Ah, good evening, traveler, and welcome to the Penumbra. Tonight's tale is... Juno Steel and What Lies Beyond. Juno? Love, do you plan on getting out of your bed at any point today, or should I expect a repeat of yesterday's performance? What's the point? Nothing out there worth the trouble. There's always me. Yeah, well, you decided to get out of bed, so whose fault is that? (laughs) Hey! (laughs) (laughs) Serves you right Trying to leave a lady exposed to the elements You've gotten stronger You let me win (laughs) (laughs) The lead up to this wedding is Difficult for you Isn't it? Can we get back to wrestling over the blanket again? Or Literally anything else? It's hard for me, too, to tell you the truth. It is? Indeed. I... (sighs) At any rate, I'm afraid I must decline the invitation to your pity party today. I've rather a lot of rehearsing to do before the big event tomorrow. Must be nice. Oh, so that's the trouble, is it? Have your feelings been hurt because our captain didn't give you a job in her wedding? No. But I am the only one she didn't give a job. (laughs) They were all taken. What, then? You wanted her to fabricate one for you? No. Maybe. That's not the only reason, anyway. But knowing you, something to do would help, wouldn't it? Perhaps a little mystery to solve? Don't condescend to me. Too late. Ow, what the hell? There's nothing in here. What is this, the mystery of why you just threw a blank notebook at me? Do you read most books by opening to the middle? Perhaps you start mid-sentence? Hey, I'm a busy guy, all right? Page one, love. I can never read your goddamn handwriting. What does this say? Open sesame. Whoa. Forgive the indulgence there. I've been reading some old Earth tales of our profession, and the phrase stuck with me. The book is writing itself. Impressive construction, isn't it? Nearly feels like a paper journal. But these are digital pages operated by a simple computer mind in the spine, dear detective. It waits, and it listens, and if you say just the right words, it reveals more of its text. But as for what those words are, well, that's the mystery, isn't it? So I have to say passwords at this thing until it writes itself? What makes you think I won't just bring it to Rita, have her bust it open in two minutes? I'm afraid this is the one security system I am certain Rita can't break. She saw to that herself. She helped you make this? Only the security. So don't get ideas about asking her what it says inside. But yes, she did. I went to her asking only that she not help you cheat, but she told me a little tale about this security system that I thoroughly enjoyed. Perhaps you will too, if you get far enough in time. In time for what? I've decided that you will receive the prize after the wedding tomorrow. Whether or not you succeed. Damn it, Mary, if you just give it to me... It won't be nearly as satisfying, yes. In fact, it will likely infuriate you. Call that the stick to the prizes, Carrot, hmm? If I decide I'm gonna do it. Of course you will. You couldn't turn down a pretty face. Oh, please, Detective. 
You wouldn't turn me away now, would you? Stop. After I've walked these cold and bitter streets for so long in search of just the right man for the job. Please, detective, please tell me you'll take my case. Fine, I'll take your stupid computer journal, Happy. Much more often than usual these days. Before you sally forth to collect the clues, love, I've been informed I must remind you that you have an appointment with our family physician in 15 minutes. What the hell are you talking about? That appointment was scheduled for yesterday. Yes, and you did not go to it. Right, like I said, so now I don't have to. She has interpreted the situation a bit differently, I'm afraid. Something, something, or I'll wring his scrawny neck. Doctors. And, Juno. Hmm? Once you've finished my little challenge... Never mind. Good luck, love. Uh, sure, you too. <laughs> I watch him leave, and for a second there's a feeling in the air that's familiar, but it scares me every time. A feeling like a minute ago my insides were snug, every little thing slotted exactly in its place. And as soon as that door closed, one big piece went missing, and now everything's a little colder, a little looser. My name's Juno Steele, and I think it's safe to say I've got it bad. Which is scary, obviously. It's always been scary, but maybe being scared is good for you, helps you grow up or something. Maybe. I'm not sure. But the way our doctor tells it, I could stand to be a little more scared. Took you long enough, Steel. Bleed on anyone since yesterday? Gallons. We were out of creamer, so I cut my fingers off and dropped them in the coffee pot. Decent flavor. Funny. Lie down and we'll start your test in a second. While I wait for Vespa, I read the new entry in Nereyev's techno journal a few times, but I can't make sense of it. Speak the name of the swamp's pearl, and the next clue will be yours. But I don't know a goddamn thing about swamps, and there aren't any on this ship, if you don't count Nureyev's room, but I'm going to assume that isn't where he wants me to go. He's so embarrassed Buddy saw it that he hasn't let anybody in since. I can't tell if that bothers me. No, that isn't right. It's that I can't tell if I'm allowed for that to bother me and still be a good... you know. Yep, still got weird stuff in your blood. Fine, whatever. What's the prescription, Doc? Weird stuff in a pill? Uh, not sure there is a prescription. We just picked up the cure for all disease, and you're not sure if there's a cure for this? First, we don't know how to use the Prime yet, so it does a fat lot of good to chop it up and shoot it into you. I've been using my own blood samples for testing, and even I'm not just going to put that thing in me. Even if it seems like it might actually work. And second, it's a pretty basic rule in medicine that you don't solve a problem unless you've got a good reason to think it's a problem. You feel fine, your vitals are good, you live with this gunk for a while before I ever found it. That stuff in you isn't doing anything, so who says it needs a cure? Uh, I kind of hoped you would. And why do you think I've been forcing you to come in here for these blood scans, Steel? The scans you keep blowing off? <sighs> Look. Whatever it is, it looks xenobiological. And you said it was a complete growth before it was confetti in your blood. Mars, right? This thing have a name before you blew it to pieces? Someone called it the Lasoniana something. <sighs> Buddy's got some books on this kind of thing. I'll see if I can find one. Uh, thanks. Vespa leaves the room for a second. I try to lasso a few brain cells around Noreev's riddle, but... Just as I'm thinking about swamps again, something bubbles in the corner of the room. The Cure Mother Prime, pulsing faster the longer I look at it. Even in a few days of experimenting, we figured out the thing knows when you're looking at it. It looks like an overloaded sausage in a sweat aquarium at its best, but stare at it for a few minutes and it starts to swell, deflate, swell, deflate. Usually. But it also starts pulsing like that for no reason at all. And I swear, when I look at it, it starts up faster. Much faster. And something about it makes my stomach do somersaults. And then there's the weird writing on its case. Even after Jet's polish, we can't make it out completely. A cure from beyond the something, save us something beyond something again. 
Just bad poetry from the Pharma Corps, probably, but something about it gets under my skin. Couldn't something. Find ah. any... So, do I add scared of doors to your list of symptoms, or is this a typical thing for you? Sorry, I was just God trying. God damn it, Seal, were you looking at the Prime again? Keep your eyes off it, all right? It's gonna exhaust itself to death before we even figure out how it works. Can it even get tired? I don't know, but it reminds me of the hydro leeches on Ranga. Those were sound sensitive, their skin all rippling if you made loud noises when they came up for air. Looked kind of like they were dancing if you played your music at them. Until they rippled a hole in their skin and popped like water balloons anyway. Sounds like a real fun time. I lived in a swamp in the middle of nowhere, Steel. We made our own fun. A swamp? Hey, Vespa, could I have you look at something for me? <sighs> Obviously, I'm your doctor. But you could give me a little warning before you come in here and whip out Not your... that. Not. Ha. That. <clears throat> Just read this stupid thing and tell me if you know the answer, all right? Speak the name of the swamp's pearl, and the next clue will be yours? Who wants to know about pudding? The hell is this? Thanks. Hey, what? I, I help you beat a level in your magic book or whatever, and I don't even get to see? I, uh, don't know if you want to. Why the hell wouldn't I? It's from Ransom, isn't it? Yep. Ugh. You two are worse than pudding. Is there some kind of... Do swamp people not like pudding? Not pudding. Pudding. <sighs> Pearls come from oysters. Pudding comes from swamp oysters. Oysters take a grain of sand and smooth it over with mucus until it becomes something hard and shiny. Swamp oysters take a mouthful of mucus and mix it with sand and dirt until it becomes a big ball of mucus, sand, and dirt. Called... Pudding. Well, now I definitely don't like pudding. Oh, whatever, I don't actually give a damn about the pudding. Steel, tell me something. You... You have a decent head on your shoulders. Sometimes. And you seem like life hasn't been the nicest to you. So, Ransom has to worry you a little bit if even you don't know everything about him? Worried for my sake or for his? Cool off, moron. I'm not trying to start a fight. I'm just... I've been thinking about trust, I guess. What it means to know someone, or how much you have to know before you're sure... You're ready to spend the rest of your life with him? You say one word about cold feet steel! Cool off, moron. I'm not trying to start a fight. I don't know the answer to that question anyway, Vespa. You'd have more experience in that than me. Then... I don't know. How long did it take you to put away the gun? The what? I just, did I mumble? How long did it take you to stop sleeping with a gun when Ransom stayed over? Duh. Oh, uh... Not very long? And what made you feel like you could put it away? I, I think I get what you're asking. I don't know. Maybe this is stupid. These but... feelings are all stupid. Spit it out. One day I just realized I didn't feel like I had to explain myself anymore. It's like everyone thinks they know you, right? They make up a version of you in their heads, and if you don't play the part right, they start asking questions. Sometimes with words. Sometimes with a look. I know. Yeah. Uh, what's wrong? Are you okay? You seem angry. All that. But I don't know. One day I wasn't playing the role the best, and I could tell he just didn't mind. Or he'd already stretched the role out until it actually fit me, and I realized I'd already done the same thing for him. That was really corny. Yep. You're lucky I disinfected this place two hours ago, or I'd puke on your shoes just to make the point. Hey, you can blame your wife for that. If she interrogates you for a year straight, you eventually learn to talk about your mess of a head. Fiancé... Don't jinx it. Listen, the thief's almost not my problem anymore, and I'm not going to tell you what to do. But I hope this doesn't come back to bite you. That's all. That was almost nice, Vespa. Thanks. Hurt can always sniff out hurt, Steel. Doesn't matter if it's wounded animals or wounded hearts. Now get the hell out of here! I've got, I don't know, stuff to clean or something! Duh.
Hurt can sniff out hurt. Went to Vespa looking for the answer to a riddle and got another one for free, because... I keep thinking I can smell that hurt on Nereev, and that he's covering it up less and less as the days go by. I know a lot about him. More than anyone else, anyway. Within a few months of our first meeting, he invited me and a growth on my eye on a behind-the-scenes tour of his mind, after all. But I know that if you don't want to think about something bad enough, you can push it out of your mind almost entirely for years and years and years. Hell, listen to yourself, Steele. He puts together this whole scavenger hunt to make you feel better, and you pay him back by getting suspicious? In the hall, I open the notebook and read the next clue to get my mind around something else. You're too late. I just caught him in my trap, and by my authority, this thief will never be free again. What the hell does that... And before you set yourself into one of your spirals, dear detective, do know that the preceding quotation is merely your clue. Signed, your better half. <laughs> well, at least this case got my heart rate up. Once the panic passed, it hit me that the clue did sound familiar. Kind of. I couldn't place it exactly, but I knew who could. And that's when I realized what Nereev was up to. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Steele. <laughs> Hi, Rita. Have you, uh, <laughs> seen Mr. Ransom today? I did. And did he give you something? Something special, maybe? <laughs> yeah, I know about his case, Rita. I have the journal right here. Oh! <laughs> oh, whoa, Rita, it's okay. It's, it's just, it's just so beautiful. The time moves so fast. It feels like just yesterday. I met you 19 years old and grown up, and now look at you. All grown up. There's gonna be a wedding tomorrow. <laughs> I'm. Uh, you know, I'm not the one getting married, right? Well, a girl can dream, can't she? <laughs> Come in. I got all excited, and now I gotta watch some bad guys get blown up to take the edge off. You wanna watch bad cops? Rita, I am sick of bad cops. Three, the legend of good cop. I mean, yeah. If you wanna get a kid to eat his vegetables, you cover them in cheese. If you want to get Juno Steele to talk to people, you cover them in a mystery. So already I think I can guess how long this case is going to be. One clue for Vespa, one clue for Rita, and one each for Buddy and Jet, and then whatever prize Nereev has waiting for me. I try to guess what it is, but I only last a few minutes. I complain about Rita's streams a lot, but sometimes lying on the floor and watching Baddest Chief's head get vaporized is just what the doctor ordered. Oh, that twist gets me every time, Mr. Steele, because you spend the whole stream thinking Baddest Chief is going to be the baddest bad guy, and then it turns out... Wait, wait, don't spoil it. Mr. Steele, we've watched the stream like a hundred times. Hold How on, can this I... is the best part. Good cop. Thank goodness you're all right. I thought the chief might have... <gasps> Good cop. Why? Don't be too hard on yourself, rookie. Everyone has to believe in something. You just decided to believe in a fairy tale. Commissioner no good? Nah, I don't bother with the security detail. You're too late. I just caught him in my trap. And by my authority, this thief will never be free again. Wait a minute. There. You get to take the fall, rookie. And I get to walk out of here scot-free. I wonder how many rookies and how many other precincts I can do with the legend of good cops. Ha <laughs> 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 Ugh. That shot, it came from the window, over there, who is that, why they look just like, just like, Ugh. Oh, I don't remember those noises, you think this time we might get to find out who Rookie saw? No, that was the journal Ransom gave me. Also, he obviously saw the real legendary good cop, duh. Oh, Mr. Steele, you always say that, but it never makes any sense. Well, it's gotta be, because, yeah, that line was the answer to Ransom's second clue. Oh, that's exciting! What's the next one? Maybe it's on one of my streams, too. Okay, it says, Speak the name of the inventor of the center bolt which held together the second prototype of the FZR experimental supercar engine. <laughs> well, so much for another stream. Pretty sure we know who this clue's for. You don't know that. For all you know, I got a hundred streams about FC whatevers. If you did, I don't think you'd call them FC whatevers. Okay, you got me. So, do you want to go talk to Mr. Jet now? 
What, are you kidding me? There's only like 20 minutes left in this stream. Turn it back on. Okay, Mr. Steele. So we finish Bad Cops 3. And then we kind of watch another one. What is it with you and werewolves, anyway? I just think they're handsome. Huh. It's been a long time since Rita and I did anything like this. Maybe ten years? It would happen every once in a while that everything got so hard I couldn't get myself to drive home at the end of the day, so I wouldn't. Rita would turn something on, and whether or not we paid attention to it, it would just play. I miss the office. I've missed it since a week after we got on the ship, honestly, but just because you miss something doesn't mean you're supposed to go back to it. <laughs> I don't know why, Mr. Steele, but tidal werewolves always makes me want to cry. I'm glad you like it. <clears throat> so, uh, Ransom says you helped him make this journal thing? Oh, just the security system. It's something I've been doing since I was just a little Rita learning to code for the first time. Oh, gosh, it was probably 40 years ago now. And I'd already broken through all the neighbor security systems a few times, so they weren't fun anymore. So I thought I'd make my own system fun and then break into that myself. And I've been doing it ever since. So this is just one of those, then? One of the security systems you build so you can just tear it down afterwards? What do you mean, one of? You said you've been doing this for 40 years. Yeah, well, I still ain't figured out the first one, all right? Jeez, you don't need to rub it in. Wow, that is secure. Kind of a lot of trouble to go to just for a game, Ransom. Yeah, I think... I think he cares a lot about you, you know? I didn't know about him at first, but... It's... It's been a good year, hasn't it, Mr. Steele? Best one in a while. Yeah. Yeah, I think it might be. Boss? I'm not your boss anymore. Save that for Buddy. Well, she ain't gonna be that much longer either, you know? I just... Maybe I shouldn't say this. I've been thinking, and... Since we're almost done with Captain Orinko, if you and Mr. Ransom wanted to go off somewhere, you know, together, I would understand. Rita. Nope. Never mind, forget I said anything. It's been over 20 years we've been working together. That's a good run, ain't it? Not good enough for me. Mind asking me that question again in another 20 years? Oh, no, but boss, I really don't want you to throw away a good thing because of me. And, and if I need to throw you away for ransom, I guess that means he's not actually a good thing, is he? <laughs> love you, Mr. Steele. I love you too, Rita. All right. All right. You gotta get out of here and solve your next clue or something, because if I cry anymore, I think it's gonna wash my whole face off. Go on. Shoot. Shoot. I check the clock on my comms. It's later than I thought it'd be. I forgot Tidal Werewolves is almost four hours long. Everyone else on the ship is probably finished with dinner. I don't hear any rehearsing when I pass Nureyev's room, but I hear him in the kitchen as I pass by. Left my blood, right's the control. I think the cure part of the prime might come from the mucus it generates. See, I took an array of tests right here. Pete, are you all right? What the hell? Almost gave me a heart attack. My apologies. I thought you said, I thought I heard... Just a little jumpy about my performance tomorrow. I don't often play for anyone but myself, so I'll... I'll just clean this up then. <sighs> Whatever. What was I saying? Anyway, the readings in this column... He's been jumpy like that for a while now. Enough so that back when we were taking the Cure Mother Prime, even I... But... I don't know what's really going on in his head, you know? And I might know more about Nureyev than most people, but when you dig down into it, the biggest event in his life I know about, all that mess with Mag and New Kinshasa, happened when he was 17. The same year Rita and I met, probably. And even if you were trying to have the most boring life of all time, something has to happen to you in 20 years. Nobody comes out of life unscathed. I've never asked him about that. Last time I wouldn't let myself ask questions about Peter and Nureyev, it was because I was scared of the answers. Am I scared again now? Hey, big guy, you know anything Good. about the... I'm glad you are here. Hand me that wrench, please. Actually, you think you could take a break for a sec, Jet? I've got something I'd like you to take a look at. Should only take a minute. In that minute, it is very likely we will all asphyxiate if you do not hand me that ring. Oh, okay. Jeez, you could have told me you were working on something important. Should I tell everybody to get their O2 masks on, get in the ruby? We would run? not have suffocated, Juno. 
That was a joke. A joke? Do I sound like I think it's funny? No, but it has amused me. Aha. Uh -huh. You had a question. You... Right. It says, uh, speak the name of the inventor of the center bolt which held together the second prototype of the FZR200 experimental supercar engine. It seems really technical, so if you need me to get any books for you or anything... Doug Falcon, can... the eighth of the Falcon Blue Corporation. Wow, you got it right. Yes. A code orange 77 prisoner is guilty of which solar crime? <laughs> Never heard a scanner code like that. Nor have I. But if it says solar, it is likely that terminology dates back to the war. That is a strange collection of trivia, Juno. It's not. It's actually a gift from Ransom. A strange gift from Ransom, then. Buddy is most likely to know the answer to that question. I believe she spent a lot of time in solar prisons as a child. Wow, she had a record that young? No. But her father was a prison owner and one who believed strongly in the virtues of Take Your Daughter to Work Day. All right. Well, guess I'll go talk to her then. Thanks, baby. I would rather you did not. I may not be working on the ship's oxygenation system, Juno, but that does not mean my current work is not important. Your assistance may be required again. What are you working on? The service for Buddy and Vespa's wedding tomorrow. With a wrench? We all have different ways of accessing our potential, Juno. I find I never think more clearly on a topic than when my attention is elsewhere. Ah! What? Did something happen in there? It did. Inspiration happened, Juno. Hell, do you think maybe next time inspiration can avoid taking a year off my life? I can promise no such thing. In my experience, growth is a very painful process. And growth for the better is especially painful. <clears throat> Juno, what do you plan to do once our work here is finished? Oh. Uh, I, I don't know. I guess I'll look at the clue in the journal, and if it's anything like the other ones, I'll probably have to talk to Buddy next. I did not mean our work in this room. And I now know you well enough to recognize that you knew it was not what I meant. Yeah, okay, but what if maybe I didn't want to talk about it? Growth is painful. But I have found that when two people are both attempting that growth, they can often find greater success if they do it together. Big guy, are you telling me you just want to talk? Talk does not necessarily need to be a part of it. I look at my watch. Between my appointment and Rita's streams, it's already mid-evening. If I'm going to have Buddy answer that last clue for me, I'll have to do it now. But the big guys never asked me for anything before. Not that I can remember, and... I don't know. Maybe I'm just tired of pretending I don't see the questions that really bother me now. I'm not sure if that's mature, though. Mostly it just feels like I'm bored of the old mistakes, ready to make some new ones. Screwdriver? Yeah, sure. We don't talk much after that, but I stay until his work is done. And I don't know if the big guy was right, if it is actually easier to think through this stuff when you're doing it with someone else, but it works anyway. I'm scared of what comes after this. I know that. Because the only life I know outside of the carte blanche is a free fall, watching me beat myself down into the mud again and again and again. Maybe it's me that's changed, and I'll be fine. But... I remember how all that mud tastes too well to go jumping out with both feet. A few hours pass. Jet's page of words for Buddy and Vespa fills up, and eventually, without a word on his progress, the big guy locks up his tools and heads for the door. He stops next to me on the way out and says, I think we may all contain a multitude of people, Juno. It is only a question of which ones we let out, and for how long. When you know what you plan to do, I would appreciate very much if you told me. I am curious who you let out next. Me too, big guy. You are very mature for your age, Juno. I've always respected that about you. I'm... What? You're only like eight years older than me. Juno, I am not 32 years old. I'm 40. Ah. I'm two seconds away from starting a fight when I see the jet smiling on his way out the door. Another joke. Just for him. And I know for a fact that a year ago I would have missed it completely. It's too late by a few hours to talk to Buddy, so I turn in for the night. The other gift Nereyev's given me with this journal is a good night's sleep, for once. A couple of hours of dumb streams, manual labor, and self-discovery will knock you right out. 
The next morning I expect to wake up with Nereev next to me, but the bed is empty. While I search the ship for Buddy, I hear a few strains of the music he's practicing for the wedding. I hate that thing he plays. But when he plays it like this, when his heart is all focused in it, it's bearable. I wonder if I'm allowed to hate that instrument. If it's a bad sign or something. But mostly I wonder where the hell Buddy is, because it's the morning of her goddamn wedding and I can't find her in her office, her chambers, the mess hall, not even the bathroom. But eventually, I do find her. Down in ship storage, a blaster in her hand and a cloud of white billowing cloth all around her. She looks like a billion creds in that wedding dress, and she also looks like the first person to say that to her is going to end up with a laser through each eye. Juno, you're late. Yeah, I was looking for you, but I uh, didn't think we were doing shooting practice this week. We've done this every Sunday morning at 6 a.m. ship time for 49 weeks straight, yet you thought this week we'd just skip it. You're getting married in like three hours, buddy. Then unless it takes you three hours to line up a shot, I'd recommend you bring your blaster over here and get started. That makeshift firing range is the one place on this ship where it feels like everything makes sense. Breathe slow to steady your aim. Narrow focus until it's all on one dot in front of you. Let all of the sounds and smells hit you and roll over you. Let your hands shake and watch them patiently until everything lines up exactly where it needs to be. Well, you don't get any points for showing off, Juno. I do, actually. Kind of how a bullseye works. Let's see what you got, Arenko. <laughs> I... Love it down here. The vinegar smell of plasma exhaust, the heat in the air, the sweat. Fifty weeks ago, this was just our storage space, where Buddy forced me to shoot at bolts on the wall with a stun shot. But we kept adding to it, little by little. Metal targets that could take a full power blast, an automatic system for dropping new targets in, ballistic glass, and a whole range of blasters and charges for standing sharp. It was hell at first watching Buddy make all those shots while I went two feet wide. I would have given up on day one if she hadn't dragged me down here week after week. And look how times change. Fifty weeks later, and the way she was laying into that trigger, I expected I'd have to drag her away before long. Wow, you're really shooting the hell out of that thing. If it mines, I'm sure it will tell me. You, uh need to get something off your chest? At the moment, it's what's in my head that concerns me most. Your turn, Juno. Uh, that's a lot of targets. Which one do you want me to hit? All of them. You get three shots. You just brought up like eight targets, buddy. I couldn't do this with twice as many shots and twice as many eyes. Nor could I. But I'm not the one with aspirations of being a great sharpshooter. Go ahead now. What's your problem today, Orinko? Oh, you can't find the angle to make the shot? Pity. I was hoping you'd learn something over the course of this year. If the shot's possible, I'll make the goddamn shot. It sounds like you're preparing yourself to fail. Yeah, and what the hell are you doing down here, huh? Wedding in three, in two hours, and you're down here. What, you want to stink like plasma on your big day? It's better than smelling like rot. And I will certainly stink much less than the two pathetic shots you're about to make. Two? You said I had three. You do. But you sound an awful lot like you're going to give up before the third one. Oh, yeah? Two targets down. Am I supposed to be impressed by that? Three shots for eight targets means an average of 2.7 targets necessary per shot rounded up. You've fallen further behind. Story of my goddamn life. Is it still? <laughs> we must be careful not to fall too far out of date on the story about ourselves which we tell ourselves. It leaves you flinching from blows that never come and blind to those that do. Yeah, well, what happens when the story's so complicated you can't figure out what it's about anymore? I believe that's called the human condition, darling. It's the wedding, isn't it? God damn it, buddy, you threw off my aim. Battlefield conditions, darling. Or do you plan to politely request that everyone stay very silent and hold all fire while you send lasers straight through them? Into them. Stun. You tend to lean hardest on semantics when you're avoiding a topic, Juno. It doesn't make any goddamn sense. How do you lean hard? Either you're leaning or you're not. One shot left. Five targets remain. 
You may not like it, but you've ended up here, and now you must adapt or fail. I don't care what kind of tricky bounces you expect me to do. Nobody in the goddamn galaxy can hit five targets with one shot. You're giving up, then? Shut up. Well, you never answered my question. Is it the wedding that has you in this mood, June? Questions are trap, and you know it. What, I'm supposed to tell you I'm miserable on your big day? I believe you just did. Come on, buddy, that's not what I meant. But in any case, you're in good company, darling, because I'm scared completely out of my mind this morning. You're not thinking of going all runaway bride on us, are you? You ought to keep that note of righteous condescension out of your voice, Juno. Glass houses and stones. I'm a hypocrite about a lot of things, buddy, but not this. I never skipped on my own wedding. Then you are thinking about your wedding. Of course I am. It's just about the only... I thought it was going to be the only thing on my mind. Then it isn't. And that concerns you somehow. You want to crawl out of my head for like two seconds, buddy? I'm trying to make this stupid shot. Ah, God damn it, you didn't even think about it when you set these targets up, did you? This has been impossible since the first shot. Give up, then. Shut up! Okay, so thinking about the goddamn wedding does worry me, alright? I did some really stupid things back when I was supposed to get married. Gave a lot of myself up real fast because I wanted to trust her so bad that I thought I could supply the trust first and wait for the trustworthiness to grow in later. That sounds extremely painful. It was! Thanks! Those were some of the most painful goddamn months of my life, which is really saying something, so excuse me if I don't want it to happen again, all right? You aren't the one getting married today, Juno. I know that! But worry's supposed to keep you safe. You're supposed to learn from your mistakes so you don't make them again, but you're getting married and there's ransom and... and... You think you aren't scared enough, and that fact scares you. Well... It sounds pretty dumb when you say it that way. I don't think it's dumb. Juno. I think it's contradictory. But we're much more contradictory than we like to admit. It's hard to believe that anything makes sense if we can't even make sense of ourselves. Thanks, Shrink. I'll give you my insurance card after I make this lousy shot. What's got you so scared, then? Isn't this supposed to be the best day of your life or something? That is what they say. An awful lot of pressure, don't you think? Sure is. Uh, impossible shot. Stupid. I've always been a performer, of course. But it's quite a different thing when the performance is by you, about you, and for you. There's no audience to impress. No finding just the right razzle-dazzle to cover over the fact that in reality you have no idea what you're talking about because whoever does, really. Whoever they are, I don't trust them. But what's the alternative, then? No risk, no reward, as they say. Perhaps we could all live peaceful, quiet, boring lives photosynthesizing somewhere. Sounds nice. Does it? Would you honestly trade every good moment you've ever had, every victory, every friendship, every bullseye shot, if it meant rubbing away the bad ones? Smooth life out into one unending dial tone? Because if you would, I think you'd better put down that blaster, Juno. You can't make this shot. There is no bullseye in your future. So why bother? No bullseye, huh? Watch this. Steady my breathing. Point the blaster, mid-power with a shallow angle for ricochet. Time slows. Draw the lines out in my mind. Refract the laser there, turn one shot into five, easy. Hard part's getting him to land where you want. I pull the trigger. That's one target. Two, three, four, and... Damn it, God damn it. Congratulations, Juno. For what? I missed the last target. That may be true. But in taking the shot anyway, you've graduated from Buddy Arinko's Sharpshooting Academy. I've taught you everything I can. I think you ought to put on some nicer clothes, and I ought to put on a few quarts of cologne, darling. The wedding's nearly upon us, and I think neither of us want to photosynthesize down here while it happens, do we? Right. Thanks. Oh, hell, I totally forgot. Buddy, I was supposed to ask you- Mutiny. What, uh, what? A Code Orange 77 prisoner is guilty of which solar crime? That's the question in your journal, isn't it? The answer is mutiny. A little bird in the guise of an extremely large man told me that that's what you needed to know. I'll see you in one hour, Juno. Don't be late. Uh, 
I'm feeling pretty sour about the conversation with Buddy as I go back to my room, shower, get changed. Or maybe just raw. It's not until ten minutes before the ceremony that I remember I'd gone to her for a reason. A clue for Vespa, for Rita, for Jet, for Buddy. Time to claim my prize. It should be, anyway, but when I get to the page, I only see a new sentence. What is my true name? Peter Nureyev. One clue for every person on board this ship, and me. So, I shouldn't be that surprised when the next clue writes itself in. And I shouldn't be surprised that only one person on this ship can answer it. It says, Who was my first love? You know I tried my own name, but even I'm not dumb enough to think Nureyev went 36 years without someone playing a riff on his heartstrings. And it hits me that for all I know about him, I can't actually imagine those 36 years in any detail. Times were hard, creds were stolen, but where, why, with who? I get shot by a feeling in my chest that's so chemical I can't figure out what emotion it's supposed to be. My heart's pounding, adrenaline up. But am I worried? I don't think so. Am I excited? Scared? I don't know. Is it a problem if I can't tell the difference? I check my comms. A message from Peter Ransom. It says, Miss you. On your way. And I realize the wedding is in two minutes. I'm all dressed up. And the journal's in my back pocket. And to be honest with you, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Or how I feel. Or why new things scare me and old things don't. I just have a wedding I'm supposed to be at, and for now, it feels good to have someplace I'm supposed to be. Everyone's there, of course, but at least I'm not late. Rita's fiddling with the lighting. Jet's fiddling with a suit jacket that seems two sizes too small. Buddy and Vespa are on opposite sides of the room. Rangi and tradition, I guess, and then... There's him. And, oh, hell... It's only been 24 hours since I saw him, but it's like I've been holding my breath that whole time, and that first look is when I can finally let it out. I want to tell him that, but today's not about us. <clears throat> it is 10 a.m. ship time. Will the guests of the betrothed please assemble on the viewing platform? Now. Vespa and Buddy. Thank you. Let us begin. In a galaxy this large, the connection between any two people must always be a miracle. It is not a miracle in the sense that it is rare. Even with so much empty space, humanity has chosen many times over to cluster together. In communities, and families, in partnerships. Our collisions with other people are inevitable. But it is a miracle in the sense that each meeting, taken by itself, is so unlikely that it may as well be impossible. If the galaxy's grand clock were reset to its start, we could assume with confidence that this group of six would never be assembled again. With lives from planets solar and outer from cities and swamps, it is doubtful that any two of us would make any connection at all. Yet here we are. And I know no name for that, but miracle. The ways I know and interact with each one of you are truly unique, because they are a product of us both. Two human beings who should never have met constructing a single connection together. All of you have constructed such connections between each other as well, a spider's web that stretches out to touch every one of us. And no matter how far we drift apart in space, those silken threads will always stretch far enough to connect. We are gathered here today in celebration of just one of those threads. This ceremony will not create that silk, it will not reinforce it nor change it in any significant way. But today, we have chosen to stop and meditate on the miracle of just one connection between a woman born in a solar prison and a woman born in a swamp on the furthest arms of the outer rim. 
Today, we admire the line of silk they have woven together, and we treat it as perhaps we always would if we were wiser, with awe at its beauty and its impossibility. Vespa, your vows, please. <clears throat> but the first time I ever saw you was the most exciting day of my life. Well, most of it was a pretty bad day, actually. It wasn't the first time I ended up in jail. But it was the first time I kind of thought to myself, you know, <laughs> I might actually be in some pretty big trouble. And all night I was sitting in my cell thinking, how in the hell am I going to get out of this one? When all of a sudden, I heard this beautiful laughter. Like, I don't know, like a dream where you're the funniest person in the world. Next thing I knew, every cell door in the block opened. Even mine. And I looked down the hall and saw the other inmates blinking like morons <laughs> instead of running. And I... I thought I saw someone in a long blue dress with all this red hair, laughing. And that was the first time I saw you, bud. The day you freed every single person in one of your dad's prisons just because you felt like it. I didn't meet you then, though, because I was too busy running. I'm not a moron! <clears throat> Second time I saw you, I was in a snooty bar on Pluto. They didn't have any beer without a whole fruit salad mixed in, so I was drinking this fizzy vodka thing. It doesn't matter. But I was drinking my fizz off the cash from my last big score when the most beautiful girl I'd ever seen slid into the seat next to me. And you said, Can I buy you your next round, darling? And I'm not much to look at. You've always been... <sighs> anyway, <clears throat> you bought me two drinks and whispered some stuff in my ear that I <laughs> won't repeat. And then you left for the powder room. And I was so starstruck. It took me 20 minutes to realize you'd stolen my score right out of my pocket. Luckily for us... I've always been good at tracking people down. I caught up with you and pulled my knife, and we fought till you started laughing. I remembered that laugh. And you said, I'll never forget, you said, well, we seem to be doing all right for ourselves solo, but don't you think we'd be better as a pair? And we were. We've lost each other and found each other, but it's always been true. We're better as a pair. And today, the thousandth, millionth time I've seen you, it's the most exciting day of my life. Thank you, Vespa. And Buddy? I had a bear of a time preparing these vows, Vespa. In retrospect, I've made a rather serious strategic error leading up to this moment. By giving myself a reputation for always having the right thing to say, I've raised expectations quite high for the moments that matter most. Like now, when I must find just the right words to describe a feeling beyond comprehension, let alone description. And so, in an impressive fit of hubris, I have decided not to prepare my words for this vow. It seems the purest show of how I love you to speak in the way you do, in the way I love so much. Words shaped in the moment, a skin around each second's feelings of the heart. Vespa, I... If I'm being honest, my love, it's still difficult for me to believe you're here. You have to understand, I was in love with a Vespa I thought had died for a very long time. In my dreams, I regularly saw your ghost. Images of you, sounds, feelings. But always with the certainty that you, yourself, were too far for me to ever see again. 
It colors everything, that feeling. Every memory gains another layer of melancholy or longing or even joy, preciousness. What I mean to say is that I have known Vespa Ilke, the ghost, much longer than I've known the woman. And these days with you, they've been everything to me. For, for a time, I thought that this might be a dream, that one day I would wake up sick and rotting in my bar on Mars without you, without this family. It seems so much more likely than the truth, but now... <laughs> Well, this is the dream, isn't it? The only difference is that now I feel certain it's not the sort of dream you wake from. I love you, Vespa. I know what a galaxy without you in it feels like. The cold. And I want you to know that I will never take this life with you for granted. I can't possibly take it for granted because having you by my side does not just improve me, love. In my eyes, it makes this entire galaxy a place worth living. I want to thank you for that, and I will today and every other day. I love you. I love you too, bud. Only the two of you together can choose what to name this connection. And so its name is yours, and yours alone. We who witness this only ask to know one thing. Will you treasure this bond forever, no matter your distance in days or miles? Vespa? I will. And Buddy? I will. Then you may kiss, and let us look upon the space which once stretched between you, so we may better appreciate your closeness on this day. The metal walls of this viewing platform part, and through the windows behind them streams starlight and space. And when you look at it, really look at it, you remember why we call it space. A gap between things. Looking at nothing is seeing yourself in more detail than looking in a mirror, because there's nothing to distract you. No light, no break in your nose or gray in your hair. Nothing gives you nothing back. And all that's left is you, your thoughts, and all that space to put them in. I look at Buddy and Vespa, and I know what they see in all that space. They just gave us a tour of all the parts we get to know. The rest is theirs. Ransom? Then, in the corner of my eye, I see him, looking at me as he plays. I feel the space between us so, so clearly, and all I want to do right now is close it. And suddenly I understand. I don't know all the answers to my feelings about him. Probably never will, but for once, it feels like I understand where I am. If I feel like I don't know Peter Nureyev, that's just because I want to know him, and I want him to know me. And if I feel vulnerable, it's because I am vulnerable, because knowing someone, all of them, means knowing their most painful places, the spots they've bandaged and padded and armored so nobody could ever touch them there again. That armor is so, so heavy, and when I look at him, I see the promise of relief. The lightness we could feel if we trusted each of us to unbandage the other. To remove that armor plate by plate until we each stand bare, fully vulnerable and fully known. And for the first time I can think of, love is not a thing that happened to me. It's a thing I made, am making, with Peter Nureyev. I want to tell him this, all of it, and I don't give a damn anymore about solving his case because I want to hear everything he has to say to me whenever he wants to say it. And then, outside that huge window, 
all that nothing fills up with a great, big, something. <laughs> what is that? A massive interstellar cruiser. I've never seen one so large move so quickly. Dark matters. There's no time to waste. Jet, warm up the Ruby 7. Vespa and I will get the Cure Mother Prime and we will meet you back at... Oh, no. Buddy Arinko and Associates, this is Subdirector G of Dark Matters. You have been found in violation of DM Code 36.227, Possession of Galactic Radical. Drop any and all weaponry on the ground or we will open fire. That's an interesting threat, darling. But I'm afraid you've already shown your hand. If you need this Galactic Radical from us, Agent then you'll M7, just have to... run a tactical scan and advise. Good. If any of them move, agents, you are authorized to kill in this order until they comply. Vespa Ilke, then Juno Steel, then Rita. All right, agent. Everyone, weapons down. <sighs> but, but, but I ain't got anything! Then stay as still as you can, darling. It will be all right. Keep your blasters trained on them, agents. Sekuliak and Ilke particularly. Director, you are clear to come through. <gasps> Director W, these are the thieves I told you about. Really? And the Class X Radical? Based on our recent sound probe recordings, we know the subject is somewhere aboard this vessel. Thank you. That will be all, Subdirector. Director, what are you doing? Sasha. Report back to headquarters that Agent G has been terminated for incompetence. Cause of death was one three-fifths charge from the Model 700 WPPK blaster. You scared the hell out of me, Wire. Juno? No, it's all right. I know her. Jeez, Director W, for a second there, I thought you... <laughs> Add one stun charge with same WPPK to that report. I need you two to start cleaning up the mess Agent G has left. The rest of you are going to need five rooms on this vessel for them and one for me. If we can't find what we're looking for, we'll need to prepare them for interrogation. But we are not leaving until we have that radical. Is that understood? Yes, yes Director. Director. Then what are you waiting for, Agents? Begin the operation. If you've enjoyed this tale, please consider donating to the Penumbra on Patreon. Our artists work tirelessly to bring you these stories, and if you have the means, we hope you will support our efforts. Every dollar helps. You can find that page at patreon.com slash the Penumbra podcast. If you support us on Patreon at the $10 level or higher, you'll receive access to commentary tracks like this one from actor Joshua Elon and co-creators Kevin Vibert and Sophie Takagi Kaner. It felt like putting on a pair of boots that you wear, like putting on a pair of winter boots that you put away over the summer and you always come back to. Mm. Uh, And they always feel a little bit different. Um, uh, Because Juno the character has changed a lot uh, in the time that we haven't really seen him. And Juno, well, first off, looks different when other people are talking about him than he does when he's talking about himself. Yes. In Juno's head, he's a very cool guy. Uh, and that is not the case when anybody else sees it. Did you know that the Penumbra has merchandise for sale? It's true. The Penumbra has partnered with DFTBA to bring you posters and postcards from our resident artists, Sharon O and Milo Mars, as well as shirts, pins, socks, soundtracks, and videos of our live shows. Just go to dftba.com and search for the Penumbra podcast. We would like to thank all who support us on Patreon, but especially Alex Figueroa, in memory of Spiral Opal, the anti Penumbra Bot Coalition Trisha Marie, Zana, Jeanette, Valentin, Ren McKinnon, Lucy Biles, 
Lucia Roach, Deity Hearted, Tazatui, The High Frog Council, Mango Citrus, Michael David Smith, A Family Can Be Two Crime Moms, A Car, A Nerdy Super Hacker, A Getaway Driver, Nereev, and A Detective, Liz Nexus, Win Buckley Saves the Universe, I'm Gonna Keep Saying Juno Steel is Non-Binary Until Everyone Gets It, Caroline Seidman, Freya, Jay Yanuzeli, Karen ZH, Dante Smith, Red L, Kim Dauber, N.B. Shaper, Minchowski, Jasper James, and Jamie Gunter for their incredibly generous contributions per episode. Thank you. This tale, Juno Steel and What Lies Beyond, was told by the following people. Joshua Elon as Juno Steel, Noah Symes as Nureyev, Chloe Cunha as Vespa, Kate Jones as Rita, Alexander Stravinsky as Jet, Sarah Gazdovich as Buddy, Marge Dunn as Agent G, and Sophie Takagi Kaner as Sasha Wire. The violin cover of Ryan Vibert's original track, Play It Again, S-A-M-M, was performed by Sue Buzzard. The Penumbra is created and produced by Sophie Takagi Kaner and Kevin Vibert. If you wish to know more about our ever-expanding, infinitely creative team of artists, musicians, editors, designers, and managers, you can read about them in the show notes of this episode. I'm afraid that is our time for today, dear travelers. We hope you will join us again soon.